Grant McKenzie. I'm uh, from McGill University. I'm actually in geoinformatics uh, in the geography department at McGill. Uh, so a little bit of a different uh, take here today. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about um, a lot of my work is in trajectory analysis uh, using uh, recurrent neural networks to look at uh, similarities of trajectories. But I'm actually going to bring it down to a sort of more applied example from geoinformatics or from GIS uh, in this sense in some project uh, my students and I were working on using uh, more, I mean, traditional or more simplistic uh, random forest approach to, to look at um, neighborhood names and identifying neighborhood names and some data sets that we're seeing. Uh, just to give a bit of a background, um, you may have heard something about this. Uh, the idea was uh, is that neighborhoods basically are, are, are administrative units that don't typically have a, a, a common uh, boundary that people have applied to them. They're not like states, or they're not like provinces, they're not like counties. Um, they actually have, uh, they're defined by the people that live in these areas. They have similar characteristics, and they tend to be fuzzy set kind of boundaries for neighborhoods. Uh, we can actually subtract that a little bit more and look at actually neighborhood names. So the first part in, in uh, neighborhood delineation within a region is actually looking at neighborhood names and identifying what those names are. Um, and so there's been some a lot of issues recently, and there's a, another article that came out on how um, there's kind of been this top-down approach to defining what neighborhoods are, uh, what neighborhood names exist, and that's kind of clashed with the um, the uh, inhabitants of a city that have actually focused on uh, what they think the name of the city is. Now, I don't, I don't want to rag on Google or any kind of tech companies in this sense. I, don't, I think they're doing a fantastic job because a lot of this is based on aggregation. You need that for uh, understanding uh, different ethnic groups, different diversity within a, a population as well. Uh, but we kind of have this clashing between what the, the citizens are saying of a place uh, and what a lot of um, sort of outside parties or third parties are saying when they define what the a neighborhood boundary might actually look like. So how do we uh, approach this idea of neighborhood names? What can we use to understand uh, what's actually being contributed to a neighborhood? Uh, how people define these sorts of things? Well, one of the things we can look at is a, a data set like Craigslist. Um, and this was a, a sample approach we took, was to look at user-generated content. So this is geotagged content, right? Every Craigslist post has a latitude and longitude associated with it. Uh, and it's got a series of uh, structured data and unstructured data associated with it as well, right? So this is a, a sort of sample, traditional Craigslist post you might expect. This is from Washington. In DC where I used to live, um, and you have a photo, uh, you have some structured text on the right side of it, sort of outlining a uh, number of rooms, these sorts of things. Uh, and then you have this beautiful, unstructured, um, supposedly well uh, spelt uh, language that people have actually contributed, right? So this data tends to be a lot cleaner than dealing with social media data, but it has some, uh, some interesting side notes to it as well. So one of the things we want to do here is we want to identify what is a neighborhood name within this data set. Um, things like, Lo in yellow there, Logan Circle and, and U Street Corridor or examples of neighborhood names. Um, we don't want to identify or, or have these false positives of neighborhood names being uh, Convention Center or Howard Shaw or Whole Foods, uh, things that are clearly spatial. Uh, they, they're tied to some location, uh, but they are not a neighborhood in this case. And then we also don't want the sort of the things that's highlighted in red there, the kind of traditional words that are associated with rental properties or apartments, right? They're not neighborhood names. They're not, they're kind of aspatial terms. They aren't linked to certain locations. Uh, and how do we do this? So there's a lot of work that's come from sort of semantic tagging, um, entity recognition, and that kind of, uh, kind of the world. But uh, what's unique about neighborhood names is often they're these sort of colloquial terms that people throw around, right? They're not going to show up as a proper noun in, in a lot of the dictionaries or, or gazetteers that we use to, to identify these sorts of uh, things. So how do we actually uh, approach this problem of identifying these different neighborhood names in the data set? Uh, just to give a quick look at what this looks like spatially, so if you look at, uh, I think this is around uh, 7,000 uh, posts in Craigslist um, associated with Washington, D.C. If we look at the n-grams, so the, the combination of terms that we have here, uh, and you can kind of hopefully see there on the left, uh, these are terms that aren't actual neighborhood names. So things like uh, Columbia Heights, uh, Georgetown, Capitol Hill, you clearly see these sp uh, spatial clustering behavior, right? So uh, you have like clearly a region that's all tagged by uh, the, the terms associated with that. On the other side, you see these n-grams that are aspatial. So they're not linked spatially. They're just terms like wood flooring or heating or ceilings, right? The kind of terms you would expect to find everywhere. There's, there's a kind of random distribution of them within the, the text or the tag that's actually being associated with this, this data. 
But what we can do, and a lot of my background from a sort of spatial statistics perspective, is actually throw a ton of these spatial statistical measures at this data and ask it to sort of identify unique spatial patterns associated with neighborhoods that we don't find in other data sets. So can it, can it learn what these, these different patterns actually are? Uh, so we have spatial dispersion patterns, nearest neighbor distance. These are all sort of common patterns. Uh, spatial homogeneity, Ripley's L, which is um, actually shown there in the graph below. Basically, it tells you at what distance you start to see a clustering behavior. Behavior. Uh, and this is a comparison between a neighborhood, which is in orange there, and then a non-neighborhood n-gram, which is in purple there. And you can sort of differentiate the two just visually in that perspective. Um, when we have spatial autocorrelation and convex hull, so we have a bunch of these different measures that are, are quite common from a, a spatial statistics approach to identify what is a neighborhood and what isn't. But what was really interesting to us is, is there one uh, set of spatial measures that actually helps us to identify a neighborhood or differentiate a neighborhood from the background noise of something like a Whole Foods or something like that? Right. Uh, so to do that, we, we, we took a very simplistic approach. We threw this into a random forest model, uh, which performed reasonably well for this. And that, our sort of next steps is to ad additionally try this with a, a bunch of different other techniques. Uh, trained it on 50% of the common neighborhood names. So we had a training data set of common neighborhood names. Uh, but this is based on things like Wikipedia, Zillow, and government data. And it's not exhaustive, right? So it doesn't include all the sort of unique idiosyncrasies of, of the data that you find in sort of like Washington, CDC, what the, what the local population population would call it. So we took the common names from that, trained on 50% of it, and then used the, the rest for validation. Uh, and then we actually took this model that we trained for Washington, D.C., uh, and then tested it uh, against uh, cities like Seattle and Montreal to see, well, how well would a model of neighborhood names trained in D.C. do compared to the local data that you have for Seattle and Montreal in this case. Uh, and another part of this from a sort of a purely sort of social science perspective was can we identify names that we previously didn't know existed, right? Are there, are there any sort of weird colloquial terms that people use or alternative names for neighborhoods uh, that aren't usually recognized in the sort of um, robust traditional data sets that we find? And, and there was some option to see that. If we look at the NAF score, so our precision versus recall for how well our, our, our very simple random forest model did in this case, for Washington, D.C., it did pretty well based on the Washington, D.C. data, right? So we ta uh, trained and tested on that. Uh, we compare the Washington, D.C. to Seattle. It actually did reasonably well uh, as well, right? So you, you, you train the data on Washington, D.C. data, applied it to Seattle, and it turns out it does a pretty good job of identifying neighborhoods, given this is all user-generated data or user-contributed content. Montreal, not so well, um, which was an interesting uh, sort of artifact of what we were finding. The reality is that the data we had for Montreal was a lot less. When we collected the data, uh, it was the six months that didn't overlap July 1st. Right? And so moving to Montreal, I realized the whole July 1st uh, issue with Craigslist is that's when everything's posted, right, before July 1st. So getting access to as much data as we wanted for the data collection probably impacted some of this model of why we're seeing this. But still, the localized data did a lot better than uh, applying a Washington, D.C. model to this as well. Some of the interesting sort of false positives that we identified here, uh, kind of what you would expect in some cases, right? So landmarks like in DC, the Capitol building, uh, Space Needle in Washington, for example. Uh, if we look at not really a company in this case, but Atwater Market uh, was identified as a, as a neighborhood. Uh, and as you start to think about it, you start to have, see this gray area of what you would actually call a neighborhood and what you wouldn't. Uh, and then you think back to the data sets on who's actually contributing these Craigslist posts. Uh, a lot of these are people trying to advertise their place as some place that you should live, right? So we're near Atwater Market. And so everybody that's anywhere close to Atwater Market would say, you know, we're near Atwater Market. It's a feature. It's a landmark they can add to it. So it starts to become identified as a neighborhood. Uh, for those of you that have, uh, I used to live in Seattle for a long time, uh, Amazon uh, almost is its own neighborhood in this sense in Seattle. So there's some discussion as to whether that's correct or not. But you start to see these sort of uh, cases like the, the Gates Foundation in Seattle shows up as a neighborhood. Large companies uh, start to show up as what we would would define or what the model defines as neighborhood, whether that's a, a false positive or not, is, is up for discussion in this case. Uh, the output from a lot of this, and, and this is a very, again, a very basic example showing sort of an applied um, aspect of this is say, if we look at Washington, D.C., the purple shows us neighborhoods that uh, we knew existed and our model did well at identifying them. Uh, the orange regions are neighborhood names or neighborhood regions that didn't have explicit names or we identified new names associated with them. Uh, and you look at the, the, the green regions there, that's actually areas where we didn't get any kind of identification of names, which brings up a whole other a discussion about where Craigslist posts things actually show up. In DC, that's by far the poorest area of the city. Uh, so you get this discrepancy of, of 
where the data is actually being able to correctly identify neighborhoods in area where there's lots of data that tend to be richer neighborhoods where they advertise in Craigslist compared to a lot of the, the, uh, the neighborhoods that don't have that data in the first place in which to actually train a, a very uh, a good model at the end of the day in this case. Uh, some takeaways from this, and this is again very very quick overview. Uh, this is really a first step in a fuzzy neighborhood delineation. Before you can actually delineate neighborhood boundaries, you need to know what a neighborhood is, right? So identify what a name of that is and what the people within the city actually call that neighborhood. Uh, we use random uh, forest in this case, but it's worth comparing a lot of other machine learning techniques. Um, again, a lot of my work is in sort of trajectory analysis, so we're, we're bringing in data sets that look at how people move within the city and other similarities in the trajectories of where people actually move and can those be used to identify neighborhoods as well. Um, this is heavily biased by the Craigslist data. Obviously, any kind of data source you throw at this is going to be a very much biased. And we, we have a, another sort of example where we show that, that Georgetown in Washington, D.C. Is, is the sort of the biggest neighborhood in terms of like the best neighborhood you could live in uh, is considerably larger than it actually is to a lot of people, right? Because that's the nature of real estate data as they sort of artificially in, enhance what that looks like. Um, we have a, a paper on this that um, was kind of just sort of an overview methodology paper to introduce a lot of these kind of techniques to the geospatial world. Um, again, this is, uh, this is sort of a new application to a lot of people in geography, uh, and so I thought it would be sort of interesting to show how some of this is being applied. Um, the last thing I'll mention here is, is sort of a plug for an uh, application that we've, we've built uh, called Frankenplace. Um, it's a thematic search mapping platform to look at uh, things like uh, all the DVpedia data, so the structured Wikipedia content, uh, to actually map that out into thematic patterns. If you look at sort of the natural language processing or sort of topic, various topic <laughs> modeling approaches to map out different themes and topics, uh, you can use this system to actually map that out and look at uh, various trends in, in, uh, in whatever search term you want to look for in this case. The, the good example we always say is if you want to look for pizza, if you search pizza in Montreal, it'll give you a bunch of pizza places. Uh, but if you search pizza in this, it'll highlight parts of uh, Italy where pizza originally started from and the sort of trend and where pizza came from as well. All right, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for sticking around. How does the uh, last application related to your topic track tables? Uh, the this one right here. Um, the, the, the linking between it is basically a lot of this, the spatial statistical techniques that we used were very similar, so looking at clustering um, based on specific locations. So a lot of this is pulling in any geotagged Wikipedia content and travel blog content, so basically all the English Wikipedia data that has location tags associated with it. Um, we analyze that in terms of the, the co-occurrence of terms, right, so the n-grams that show up within a Wikipedia, uh, within a Wikipedia data, uh, and then as you search for something, it clusters those uh, and maps them as sort of in a kernel density heat map for this. So the, the tie in between them is loose. It's basically based on uh, spatial signatures that we see on the data. Any other questions? Uh, just wanted to know what, is, what, what, what was exactly the input data you used in the random forest? Was it like text, te uh, like the whole ad te text you could find on the uh, so we, we list? Well, we parsed out basically all n-grams up to three. Um, and looked at the distribution of those, cut off the long tail, so everything that only appeared less than 20 times in our text, and anything that was above a certain amount, so all your stock words that traditionally show up, which, you know, you started with about a million unique n-grams per city, and they, you cut that down to about 6,000 unique terms that each were assigned a, a latitude and longitude value based on which Craigslist post they showed up at. Yeah. So do you have a, a map of Montreal that uh, uh, like the, the one I, I saw for uh, New York or uh, Washington? I don't. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, did for this paper, we'd only had the D.C. because I was, I was actually living in D.C. when we, we did this work. And I, okay. moving here, I, I, it was kind of an add-on to this to look at it because I, it would be really interesting to actually yeah. map that out and do that. So. And uh, French ones are not a problem, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, should, it shouldn't be subjected to like the, the language issues from, like, or, or dis discrepancies between it. But yeah, you control for, for uh, various components with that, for sure. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>
other question? Well, that's good. Thanks very much, Grant. Thank you.